in honor of the holiday of Hanukkah, I decided to re-release this episode that was originally recorded many years ago. In fact, in 2017, that's when we released this episode. I spoke with my friend Shia, and he told me that he listens to it every year, and he says it's wonderful. I haven't listened to it in many, many years, but uh, he says he listens to it every year, and this was the first episode of mine that he ever listened to, so I'm re-releasing it this year, and you know, I probably would have felt a bit sheepish about doing it last year because I hadn't done a new episode on the Jewish History Podcast in a while, but now we did, you know, we did uh, one what, about a, a week ago, a week and a half ago, and then uh, previously a week prior to that, and I will tell you that I already recorded the next new episode of the Jewish History Podcast. So please enjoy this podcast, The History of Hanukkah, Hellenism, Heroism, and Hasmoneans. It was recorded a long time ago, but it's still evergreen. And of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. So tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, and I wanted to talk about the history of Hanukkah, Hellenism, Heroism, and Hasmoneans. And the story begins with the Greek domination and influence upon the Jewish people. Of course, the Jews, when they entered Israel, they established sovereignty, and they maintained sovereignty for several hundred years. But with the arrival of the Assyrians initially, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, and the Greeks, and then the Romans, uh, there is successive centuries where the Jews in Israel, or Judah, however you want to call that place that we call Israel today, uh, were subject to being controlled by a foreign influence, by foreign overlords. And the Greek domination over Israel, it lasted for several hundred years. And it's important because it added a new dimension to the challenges of acclimating, of existing together with foreign values and foreign influences and foreign forces. Because the Greeks they actually had something in common with their Jewish subjects. And there was a lot of ideological overlap between these two peoples. And that created somewhat of a toxic mix because the Greek ideas and the Greek ideals uh, were very much in conflict with Torah. So let's tell the story. It begins with Alexander the Great, Alexander of Macedonia. He assumes power at the age of 19, taking over for his father, Philip, who died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. It's possible that Alexander himself was responsible. And Alexander begins an unprecedented campaign to conquer the entire known world. So he begins with the systematic conquest of the Persian Empire, which previously was the most dominant empire in the world and was the historical arch nemesis of the Greeks. And he continues to systematically mow down everyone that stood in his way. And he conquered the entire known world all the way to India, uh, to North Africa and Egypt, to Asia Minor and Assyria. And when they get to India after a 10-year campaign, he had assumed that that was the end of the world and they find more land ahead of them. And he wanted to march forth, but There was the prospect of mutiny amongst his troops. They had been on a multi-year campaign. They wanted to go home. So reluctantly, Alexander turns around and heads back west, and he dies along the way. He never actually gets back home in Babylon. And he's considered to be one of the greatest, maybe the greatest, military tactician of all time. He would always be able to find the vulnerability in the defenses, and he would win every battle, even when heavily outnumbered. Over the course, it's astonishing, over the course of a 10-year campaign, he never lost a single battle, and he was victorious even when the odds were stacked against him. Of important significance to the Jews was Alexander's conquest of Jerusalem, of Israel, of Judah. Over the many millennia of the history of Jerusalem, it was captured and recaptured many times. By many different people. What's important to stress about Alexander's conquest of Jerusalem, of Israel, of Judah, was that he conquered it without a battle and without any bloodshed. And the Talmud actually gives a remarkable account of what happened. In Israel at the time, in Judah at the time, 
It was the Jews, but there was also another people named the Samaritans. And the Samaritans have been in Israel, have been in Judah since the Assyrian conquest, since Sancheirib, many hundred years prior. If you've ever heard the term, the 10 lost tribes of Israel, that's because Israel had splintered into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah after the death of King Solomon. And you have, you had a civil war between various parts of our nation, and there was the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes. And these maintained separate kingdoms for, for a long time, for more than 100 years. And then the Assyrians came under the leadership of Sancheirib, and they conquered Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, but not the southern kingdom of Judah. And when they conquered a people, if you want to maintain a huge empire and try to repel and repulse any revolt from your newly conquered people, so there's two ways to go about it. You can either do it with, with brute force, but what the Assyrians did, they would take a people and send them into exile. And they would swap various peoples from various conquered lands with each other. So they took the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes, and they scattered them throughout their empire. And in their stead, into the land of Israel, they brought the Samaritans. These Samaritans are called the enemies of Israel. They're not the good Samaritans. They're the bad Samaritans. And they've, they're, 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 they're a thorn in the side of the Jews for the entire existence together. Even when the second temple was rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah, these Samaritans did everything they can to sabotage the efforts. So these Samaritans, they go over to Alexander and they lobby him for permission to destroy the temple and to kill all the Jews in Judah. And they tell Alexander, falsely of course, that there's this temple in the city of Jerusalem where all the Jews get together and pray for your demise and pray for your downfall. And they rile Alexander up. And Alexander, at the helm of a mighty army, starts marching to Jerusalem. And the Jews, they get wind of it. And they send Shimon Hatzadik, who was the high priest, the spiritual and political leader of the Jewish people, the last remnant of the men of the great assembly, and they send him ahead of a contingency to go convince Alexander to change his mind. And the Talmud of the Book of Yom on page 69a tells us what happened. Shimon Atzadik, he puts on the eight priestly garments of the high priest. And together with all the notables of Jerusalem, they head out to greet Alexander holding burning torches. And the whole night, these two groups, the Greeks with the army, and Shimon HaTzadik with all the Jews, with all the tzaddikim, with all the righteous people of Israel, are walking towards each other. And at daybreak, they meet each other. And Alexander asks his generals, who are these people? And the Samaritans tell him, well, these are the Jews who rebelled against you. And as they get closer to each other, Alexander sees Shimon HaTzadik. And he jumps off his horse. And he bows before him. And the generals and his people are absolutely flummoxed by what they see. A great king like Alexander is bowing before the lowly Jew? And Alexander responds, The visage, the image, the countenance of this man goes before me triumphantly in my battles. Every night before an important battle, I would have a dream and this man would appear to me and he would assure me a victory. Alexander is so excited to see him. And he walks over to them and says, why did you come? And they respond, well, there's a bunch of idolaters who misled you into trying to destroy the temple, the home where prayers are offered for your sake and for the sake of your kingdom. Alexander can't believe it. Who are these people? So they point to the people walking with him, the Samaritans. These people want to destroy our temple. And Alexander says, turns the table, behold, they are now delivered into your power. And the Jews are able to suppress the Samaritans who wanted their doom. Now, regardless of the historicity of this particular episode, of course, the Talmud has canonized 
many hundred years later. This is happening in the 320s before the Common Era, and the temple is finalized in the 5th and 6th century of the Common Era. So we're talking about a gap of many hundred years. But it's undeniable that Alexander had a very warm and friendly relationship to the Jews. In fact, thanks to his peaceful conquest of Judah, the Jews unanimously agreed that all Jewish boys born in the next year were to be named Alexander. And until this day, the name Alexander and its variant sender, they're still a Jewish names. Now, the Greeks are in control of Judah. When the Greeks conquer a nation, it's more than just a territorial grab. The Greeks believed in spreading Greek culture, known, of course, as Hellenism. And Hellenism was the idea of bringing as much of the beauty of the physical existence of the body, of the physical world, and bringing it and letting it shine. Even in the Torah, the Torah talks about the three sons of Noah and the one that ended up settling Europe and is the forbearer of Yavan, of Greek. His name is Yefet. And the Torah describes him as Yaft Elohim Yefet. Let there be beauty in Yefet. And the, the, the Talmud even says that there's something really beautiful about the Greek way of life. And it's manifest in their art, in their architecture, in their language, in their philosophy, and certainly most of all with their obsession with the human body. They built these gymnasiums, they were all into promotion of sports, and they didn't believe that the human body is anything to be ashamed of, so they would prance around in the nude. And that was their idea. And when they would capture a land they would try to infuse it with their way of life, with their culture. And the problem is, is that Hellenism is antithetical to Judaism. We place God at the center of our focus and our consciousness. In fact, we look at the body, the physical body, and the physical world as hindrances in our efforts in life because they obscure God and they obscure the spiritual world. We look at life as being a clash between the temporary and the permanent, between the ephemeral and the eternal. The body, well, that's temporary, and it connects us to the temporary world. Torah is about exposing the beauty of our soul, of the permanent half of ourselves, which connects us to the permanent world we call Olam Haba. In fact, a simple way of remembering what Torah is about is to think about a mitzvah, a commandment to the Torah as being an act naturally desired by the soul, whereas a sin, the opposite of a mitzvah, is an act that's naturally desired by the body. And thus, we believe that we exist in a conflict between our two warring factions within us. We have a body that's pulling us to this world. We have a soul that's putting, pulling us to the next world, to the spiritual world, to God. And these are in constant conflict and we have to, using our free will, choose if we're going to veer to the body and give in, so to speak, or we're going to overcome our body and embrace our soul. Thus, we also believe in beauty, but beauty not one that's temporary and fleeting, but beauty that is permanent, that is the beauty of our soul. And thus, we're introduced with this new culture that is sort of like us because they also believe in ideas and they have a universalistic vision and they have a, a, a destiny that they believe in and they have philosophy and they, and they believe in the modes of interacting with the world on a deep level the way we do. They're not a bunch of barbarians or at least not initially, or they didn't expose that part of their essence until much later. So there is some sort of commonality between the two, but the problem is, is that they're actually embracing the exact opposite of what we have been promoting for a thousand years at that time. And for the next 160 years or so, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, the land of Judah, are going to be under Greek 
dominion in one way or the other. I think it's one of the great ironies in modern Israel. The name for the Olympic Games, the games of organized sports, is called the Maccabee Games. Now, the Maccabees, they were the group that revolted against the Greeks and against Hellenism. They were the ones who came to wage war against the ideals that the Greeks introduced to the world in their Olympic Games. And it's really tragically ironic that in modern Israel, the name of those games are called the Maccabee Games. Now, the Greeks in the beginning, they had a moderate influence among uh, on the people, on the Jews. They were somewhat successful in trying to integrate Hellenism, but only into small pockets of the nation. Primarily the upper class, the priestly class, the people who had much more of an incentive to embrace the Greek way of life. But overall, it was widely rejected by the masses. But there is a group, a small but very vocal, very powerful group amongst the Jewish people that became Jewish Hellenists. They were Jews. Maybe they observed some of Judaism or Jewish law, but they were Greek citizens first. Now, Alexander dies in 323. He's only 32 years old. And it quickly became clear after his death that there's no single leader that could fill his shoes. And eventually, his empire is splintered and his kingdom is divided into three separate empires, each one of them ruled by one of his great generals. So you have the Seleucid or the Assyrian Empire in Assyria. You have the Ptolemaean or the Egyptian Greek Empire in Egypt, and you have the Macedonian Empire in Macedonia. And if you understand how the map looks, or the Middle East looks, Israel or Judah is sandwiched between the Egyptians, between the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid, the Assyrian Greeks, and therefore it's going to be a flashpoint between these two Greek empires, and it's going to trade hands between them. So initially, Israel is under the control of the Egyptian Ptolemaic Greeks, and they were comparatively liberal and tolerant and did not push Hellenism very aggressively. They had a live and let live attitude. Eventually, the Jews are going to be subject to the Seleucid, to the Assyrian Greeks, and that's going to change very dramatically. But for the first hundred years of Jews living under Greek rule, it's going to be under the Ptolemaeans. And this time, there's a critical development in Jewish history that's going to happen under the Ptolemaeans. And that is the writing of the Torah, the translation of the Torah into Greek, the Septuagint. So the first leader was Ptolemy I. He was also called Ptolemy Soter. He was a close confidant. In fact, he was one of Alexander's bodyguards, and he was one of his most trusted advisors and generals. He dies in 283, and his son Ptolemy II, or Ptolemy Philadelphus, he becomes king, and he inherits a kingdom that is consolidated, that is tranquil, and that for the most part of his term, he's going to rule for 39 years, it's not going to be about war and conquest. And therefore, there is a redirect and focus of the Greeks to matters of culture, and especially to literature. So these new Ptolemaic Greek overlords start building all kinds of libraries all over their empire. And Ptolemy II, the king, he loved books, and he built a massive library to include all the works that he could peruse. And he was really anxious to get a copy of the Torah. And the Torah was an ancient book already at the time, but it's written in Hebrew, a language that he did not understand. So he came up with a plan. His plan was he invited a group of 70 Jewish scholars and he put them each in their own room and did not allow them to collaborate. And he told them, I want you each to translate the Torah, the Bible, into Greek, and thus the Septuagint, which means the like Septuagenarian, uh, Sept means seven, the translation of the 70. And the Talmud tells what happened in the Book of Megillah on page 9a. 
It happened that King Ptolemy gathered 72 elders and placed them in 72 rooms without telling them why he had gathered them. And he went to each of them and said, translate the Torah of Moshe, your teacher, to me. And the problem is, is that there's certain verses in the Torah that a literal translation would cause the reader to misinterpret their meaning. And therefore, it's one of the miracles that we say, each one of these 72 scholars made the same 36 amendations to the translation in order to prevent Ptolemy from misinterpreting. So for example, uh, one of the early verses in Genesis says, Na'ase Adam betsalmenu. Let us make man in our image. Now, if you read that without understanding some of the oral Torah that goes behind it, that, that reveals the critical insights, it sounds like there's more than one authority. Let us make man. And, of course, we believe there's only one God. So, each one of these sages on their own recognized that it's appropriate to change the translation. It says, I shall make man instead of we shall make man. There's an interesting parallel story here. Uh, in the Talmud, the book of Babakama, it tells that the Romans sent an envoy of scholars to go study Talmud in the yeshiva. And they went there, and the, the idea being is that you're going to go investigate. What do these Jews actually believe? What are they saying about us? So they sent two scholars to the yeshiva to go study Talmud. And they're there for years and years, and they really connect to Torah. And when they're done, they say to them, we agree with everything that we've read with the exception of one law. There was one law that they found, uh, they took umbrage with. But we're not, when we go back to Rome to report our findings, we're not going to bring this up because the Torah is so beautiful. In aggregate, we're just, we're just going to let it slip. We're just going to ignore it. Now, the sources actually ask a question. At the time, the Romans were inspecting the Torah to find out if there's anything objectionable in it. And if there would be, there would be very harsh consequences for the, for the Jews. So why did the Jews not lie? Why did they not obscure this one objectionable part of the Torah, objectionable in the eyes of the Romans, that is, in order to prevent a decimation, potentially, of the Jewish people. You know, the, the, the law is that we're allowed to do almost anything to save a life, certainly to save a life of, of many. So the Yam Shol Shlom, the Maharshal, he gives an answer, and he says that we're not allowed to lie about the Torah, even if your life is in peril. It's, it's like one of the cardinal sins. You have to give up your life to not corrupt the Torah. So the obvious question is, if when the Romans came to study Torah, the Jews did, did even though it meant that they were put, put themselves in danger as a result, they didn't change the Torah. And here, the 70 translation, 70 person translation of the Torah to the Greeks, they did change. They made 36 emendations. And the obvious answer is, is that here, they weren't changing the meaning of the Torah. They only changed the translation to ensure that there would not be a misinterpretation. Of course, we only believe that there's one God. Now, why does it say, let us make man? So Rashi tells us, because God was consulting with the angels. But the very next verse says that God made man. So the, the meaning was that only God created man. However, the way it was written, the way it is literally to be read, may lead you down an erroneous path and make a mistake. And thus, to the contrary, they weren't changing the Torah and trying to lead the Greeks to not understand it. It's the exact opposite. They changed the, inter they changed the translation in order to ensure that the Greeks indeed do understand it. But regardless, this episode again demonstrates the commonalities that the Jews had with Greeks. The Greeks were so obsessed with knowledge and with learning that they were the first ones, you know, of, of all the empires that the Jews had interacted with previously, they were the first ones that were so keen on learning about Torah and learning about the Jewish way of life that they commissioned this grand effort to translate 
the Torah. Now, for us, the date that the Torah was translated became a fast. I think it's the eighth day of Teves. It became a fast day and a day of mourning and sadness for our people. We say, Torah tzivalanu Moshe, morashati hilat Yaakov. Torah is the birthright of the Jewish people. In our history, we have suffered almost nothing but anguish by the Torah being open to the non-Jews. They could use it now against us. They can misinterpret it. They could tweak it whatever they, the, way, the way they want. We are not happy about the fact that the Torah, the doors of the Torah, the Torah, the birthright of our people, the bind that connects us to the Almighty, the Torah is now in the hands of non-Jews. That's, that caused some problems for us. But during this century, when the Jews are under the leadership of the Ptolemyans, Hellenism is being promoted, sure, and it had some sort of harsh impact on the people. Like we said, there's libraries replete with Greek philosophy, there's pagan temples being built everywhere, there's gymnasiums and houses of entertainment and sports that are built and causing problems, and there's a certain contingency of Jews who are swept up by the wave of Hellenism, but for the most part, the core of the nation is unaffected. There are going to be two movements. The most notable of them is the Tzedokim, the Sadducees that are going to sprout up at this time and are products of the Hellenistic influence upon the Jewish people. These movements really don't pick up steam until much later. Now, in the year 198 before the Common Era, the Assyrian Greeks, the Seleucid Empire, they captured Judah from the Ptolemyans. And under the leadership of Antiochus III, or Antiochus the Great, they become the new overlords over the land. In 175, Antiochus IV, he becomes emperor, and he fashioned himself as Antiochus Epiphanes, which means Antiochus the Great, or even Antiochus God Manifest. And he was a little bit deluded. He believed in himself to be divine. So he begins erecting statues of himself in all the temples of all religious people under his rule, and he mandates that they prostrate themselves before him. Of course, we could see how the problems are going to result from such an attitude. And he himself was a avid promoter of Hellenistic ideals. He was very aggressive and forceful in promoting, in promoting the Hellenistic agenda. He himself would even dance in the nude at these lavish Hellenistic entertainments that he would commission. And he began to really escalate the war on Torah. So he begins by meddling into the internal Jewish affairs. He sees the high priesthood. The high priesthood is the highest office, the highest spiritual office in the land. There was a righteous high priest by the name of Chonyo, and he had a Hellenized brother, Jason, and he decides, I don't want to have this really righteous tzaddik as being the high priest. I'm going to decide that his Hellenized brother is going to be high priest. And at the time, the high priest was more than just the spiritual leader. He was also the political proxy for the nation. He was also the tax collector. And Jason, he comes to Antiochus and says, I'm going to help you promote your goal of Hellenism I'm going to raise all the funds needed and I'm going to really infuse the Greek way of life over the people. So he's installed as high priest. He starts building gymnasiums and foisting Hellenistic practices upon the Jews. And in the year 168, together again with the renegade Jewish Hellenists, Antiochus Antiochus intensifies his Hellenistic efforts against the Jews. And he begins to establish very severe, restrictive edicts against many core Jewish practices. And that's important to note that not only was this effort, was this campaign supported by his Jewish Hellenist allies, the Jewish Hellenists were not only complicit in the campaign, they were the primary catalysts for it. They prevailed upon Antiochus to make the decrees and were the most energetic enforcers of them. And there was even a time when the Greeks wanted to deprioritize their Hellenization efforts in Judah. 
and they had other conflicts in the empire that they wanted to spread their resources to, but the Hellenists entreated upon them to continue. And it's a really significant watershed moment in the devolvement of the Jewish nation during this time. In all times of our history, we've had sinners. That's not new. But the Jewish Hellenists of this era, it did, they did mark something that was hitherto unseen. In previous eras, the sinners were content with their own abandonment of Torah. And even when people did abandon Torah, many of them still maintained a lot of Jewish practices. The Hellenists, they sought to corrupt the nation from within. They wanted those who circumcised their children, those who observed Shabbos, those who ate kosher exclusively, those who observed Torah and studied it, they wanted them dead. They joined forces with the enemies of Israel in burning the holy books and hunting down the Jews, hiding from the evil oppressors. They were not content with their personal repudiation of Torah. They wanted to make the Torah forgotten entirely. And thus begins an outright militant assault on Torah and Judaism. And they banned the Greeks together with their Jewish Hellenist cohorts. They banned on pain of death, Torah study, observance of Shabbos or Jewish holidays, the laws of kosher, the laws of circumcision, the laws of nida. They would go out of their way to infuse impurity into the Jewish people. They would force feed pigs to Jews. Jewish mothers who were guilty of the high crime of having their sons circumcised, were thrown off cliffs together with their newly circumcised sons, Jews became fair game, and they lost all protection of the authorities. It was common at the time that brides were snatched from their wedding celebrations and violated by the officials. And Antiochus even installed an idol to the pagan god Zeus in the temple and commissioned sacrifices to it. For Jews, and of course Jews at the time, there is no greater defilement of the sacred than idolatry and nothing more sacrilegious than to bring idolatry into the holiest place in the world, the holy temple. Now, there were some Jews, mostly the ignorant Jews, the more vulnerable Jews, the more vulnerable factions of our people who did capitulate to the Greeks and to the Hellenists, mostly out of fear. But the majority of Jews, the masses, they steadfastly resisted the Hellenization efforts. Many were tortured. Many were massacred with barbaric cruelty. They were strangled, whipped to death, torn to pieces. And many, of course, fled to the mountains and hid in caves. The tradition that we have of the dreidel The tradition states that this game was developed by Jews who were studying Torah illegally in the caves. And then when the, then they would have someone on the lookout. And when you see the groups of Hellenists and Greeks coming to look for Jews studying Torah, they'd hide their Torah books and replace it with the dreidel. And when the Greeks walked into the room, they said, no, 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 we're not studying Torah. We're playing, we're playing poker, the equivalent of poker. And thus, Jews remained true to Torah, even if it meant having to give up their life in heroism and martyrdom. And there's a very famous episode, the episode of Chana and her seven sons, which it's, of course, only one story, but it symbolized the trend of Jews giving up their lives for God and his Torah at the time. This story is told over in the book of Maccabees, uh, which is a Jewish book from the time it wasn't included in the Torah the, the, or in the Tanakh and the Jewish Bible because the Jewish Bible is already canonized previously. But it tells the story of a mother and her seven sons. Each one of them refuses to either eat pork or to commit idolatry. And he tortures and kills the sons one by one. Now in the Talmud, in the, in the book of Gittin on page 57b, it says a very similar story. The timeline is not clear. Did this happen during the Greek times or the Roman times, but the way the Talmud tells it is that each one of the sons, when asked by the emperor to bow down to the idolatry, they would each quote a different verse in the Torah that says that there's only one God and we have to reject idolatry. And one by one, the kids are murdered. 
And it ends with a very poignant and moving tale of the last, the youngest son. And the emperor takes his cindering and flicks it on the floor and says to him, listen, I'm not going to make you bow down to the idol. Just bow, just bend down and pick up the signet ring and give it back to me. And people will look and say, he looks like he's bowing down to me and then I'll let you go. All your six brothers are dead. You should stay alive. And he says, absolutely not. And he too is murdered in cold blood. And the Talmud ends that Chana, the mother of these seven martyrs, she tells her sons, go to Abraham, our forefather, and tell him, you, Abraham, you made one altar for one son. I made seven altars for seven martyrs, for seven sacrifices. And she went crazy and she went and jumped off the roof and died in a tragic way. And the Talmud concludes, with the verse in Psalms 113, Aim Habanim Smecha, the mother of the sons, is joyous. Now, in the year 167, this is a year and change into this effort of Hellenization, the revolt begins in the city of Modin. And the story goes, a band of Greek soldiers came, they erected an altar, and they sought a Jew willing to sacrifice a pig to the pagan god. Now, Matisyahu, an elderly local Kohen, he makes an impassioned speech to the people and he pleads with them and he urges them to refrain from giving in to this horrible act of treason of sin. Yet, a local Hellenized Jew volunteers and he ascends the platform and he takes the knife to sacrifice the pig and Matisyahu, in a fit of zealotry and rage, he grabs a sword that he had hidden under his tunic, under his robes, and he slays the traitor. And then he turns to the Greek soldiers and starts attacking them. And they're taken aback and they're surprised. And all the Jews pounce upon them and slay them all. And thus begins the Maccabean revolt. Now from his perch in Antioch in Turkey, Antiochus responds, and he sends his general Apollonius with 2,000 seasoned soldiers to squelch the ragtag rebellion. The Jewish force is now commanded by Judah Maccabee, one of the five sons of Matisyahu, is comprised of 600 men. And they lay in wait in the hills. And as the Greek forces come between these two hills, they pounce upon them. And with maniacal tenacity, and with a surprise attack, they managed to decimate all 2,000 seasoned soldiers. And in a move demonstrating the attitude of the rebellion, Judah seizes Apollonius' sword and holds it high and would use this, that sword for the rest of the war. The revolt expands. It spreads like wildfire amongst the people of Judah. Masses of eager Jews join the resistance. The force swells to a thousand men. Antiochus sends a second general, Ciron, with a force of 4,000 men to destroy this renegade group. They land in the port of Jaffa, and they're supremely confident in their pending success. They encounter the Jews in battle near Beit Choron, and they were totally unprepared for the maniacal guerrilla warfare that the Jews showed. They would have a battle cry, Mi kamocha ba'elim Hashem, who is like you? Hashem, which by the way is the acronym for Maccabee. And they would fight recklessly and fearlessly and passionately. And in the battle, 800 Greeks are killed and the remainder, remainder scattered and fled for their lives. And now, of course, Antiochus is determined to absolutely crush the rebellion. And he sends an army of 40,000 men, along with 7,000 cavalry, led by three prominent generals, to finally stamp out the rebellion. They were so confident in their victory that they advertised in slave markets across their empire that there would soon be a glutton supply of slaves. And they urged all the slave owners from everywhere to prepare for the ensuing bonanza of Jewish slaves. 
Judah and his forces are encamped in Mitzvah. And one of the Greek generals, he came up with a plan to have a midnight surprise attack on the Jewish camp with 5,000 Greek soldiers. Now, Judah got wind of this, and he planned a concurrent surprise attack against the Greeks. So they're walking throughout the night, and they're fasting, and they're studying Torah as they journeyed. And the Greeks, they're coming, and they arrive at the Jewish camp, and it's empty. And they realize what has happened. By that time, the Jews were already surrounded the Greek encampment, and all the Greeks are still sleeping, and the Jews divide into four groups, and they pounce upon them from all four sides, and shrieking like madmen, they find the Greeks asleep. And the Greeks are awakened by these blood-curling shrieks, and were absolutely slaughtered. That day, 9,000 Greeks died, and the force of the army was stunted. Soon afterwards, the news arrived from Antioch that Antiochus and Antiochus had died. This inspired the Jews who proceeded to march on to Jerusalem and liberate it from the foreign Greek hands. After a three-year revolt from 167 to 164, the Maccabees succeeded in recapturing the temple and rededicating it. And they found only a single uncontaminated flask of oil with the signet ring of the high priest on it. For the menorah sacrifice, for the menorah offering, it's important to have the highest quality oil, which was only found in the tribe of Usher in the northern part of Israel. And they only found one which would only suffice for one day. And it would take eight days for a group to travel four days north and four days south to bring back the new virgin olive oil from the north. Yet, miraculously, the oil that was supposed to last for only one day, that was allocated only for one day's light, stayed alit for eight days. And the sages of Israel established the holiday of Hanukkah to remember the great victory of the Jews over their enemies, but more importantly, to memorialize the preservation of the Jewish religion and of Torah in face of its enemies. The war would continue for many years. Indeed, it would be 25 years before the Jews would be able to succeed in reestablishing hegemony over the entire land of Judah. This kicked off the Hasmonean era, the Hasmonean dynasty. All five brothers are dead with the exception of Shimon. He becomes the Nasi, the president of the new sovereign state of Judah, and they would remain in power for nearly a hundred years until the arrival of Pompey and the Romans. Every Hanukkah, we read the prayer that captures the miracle. I'll read it to you here. In the times of Matasio, of Matthias, the son of Yochanan, the Kohen Gadol, Hashman, the Hasmonean, and his sons, when the evil, wicked, Greek kingdom stood up on your nation, Israel, to make him forget your Torah and to make him repudiate the laws that you are desirous of. And you, in your overwhelming mercy, you stood up for them in their time of sadness, of tragedy. You waged their wars, you judged their judgings, you avenged their vengeance, you gave the, the mighty in the hands of the wicked, the many in the hands of the few, the impure in the hands of the pure, the wicked in the hands of the righteous, the wanton sinners in the hands of those who study Torah. And for you, you made a great and holy name in your world. And for your nation, Israel, you made a salvation, a redemption like this very day. And afterwards, your sons came to the temple and they cleared it out and purified it. And they lit the candles in the courtyard of your temple, and they established the eight days of Hanukkah to give thanks and to give praise to your great name. The war of the Hasmoneans against the Greeks was the first religious war, but it would not be the last. Many Jews were enchanted by the Greeks. They flirted with their culture, with their way of life. 
The Greeks, after all, they seemed very civilized. They were sophisticated. They were cultured. They were intelligent. But now, their true nature was exposed in a very similar way to what happened in Germany many hundreds of years later. A scientific and civilized people were exposed for the utter barbarians that they truly were. But many Jews, even after the destruction of the Greeks and the banishment of them from the land, they maintained their Hellenistic ways. Certainly, the Hellenists were persona non grata, but they morphed into the Sadducees and the Baitusim, and they maintained a thorn in the Jewish side for many hundred years. Sadly, the Hasmonean dynasty itself faltered and capitulated to becoming Sadducees. In fact, the family of the Maccabees, they were from the Kohanim, they were, they were Kohens, they were priests. And we know that to be a legitimate king of Israel, you have to be a direct descendant of King David. King David was from the tribe of Judah. Thus, a Hasmonean, a Kohen, cannot be a legitimate king. So Shimon, the son of, of Matisyahu, he only named himself the Nasi, the, the, the prince or the, the president. But his heirs, they made themselves kings. And they were not, be, they were not viewed by the nation as being legitimate. And in fact, many of them, as we said, became Sadducees themselves. One of them, by the name of Alexander Yanai, he made a campaign against the rabbis in Israel. He assassinated all the rabbis in Israel, besides for the ones who were able to flee. And there's a very famous episode of him mocking the temple practices on the festival of Sukkot, and surrounded by his garrison of protectors and bodyguards, he goes out of his way to belittle and denigrate the, the practices that the whole nation holds very dear. And the story goes is that the entire nation started pelting him with their esrogs, with their esrogim, and they almost killed him. But in a fit of rage, he tells his bodyguards to go kill whoever they see. And 6,000 people died. But that shows, that's one story, but there's many stories, that showed that while the Greeks were gone, and even the Hellenists, they were quieted, but the Greek influence, the idea of viewing Torah and the Jewish way and the Jewish tradition as being backwards, as being archaic and obsolete, that did not go away. The notion of trying to embrace the ways of the Greeks and the ways of the Gentiles and looking shamefully on Jewish tradition, that was there to stay. And the first battle was, 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 was over, but the next battle, and the battle, I would argue, is still continuing until this very day. Regardless, Hanukkah is a, is a, is a time of celebration, but also a time to remember that the real war, the war that we still have today with Greek culture, it's still very much ongoing. And we're, we hope that we can embrace the ways of the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans to stick up for Torah and what we believe in in our tradition, despite the many challenges that we face in doing that.